looking to create a closed terrarium that is self-sufficient and will survive years or even decades into the future, you clicked on the right video. Ideally, closed terrariums will require zero maintenance over their lifetime, but setting them up correctly is key. And all too often, I see people make the same mistakes that will leave their ecosystems either not thriving or not surviving at all. So let's get into it. Six mistakes that will kill your closed terrarium. Number one, avoid too high of temperatures. High temperatures are a common reason for a rapid die off in closed terrariums. Now, don't get me wrong, persistently low temperatures, even those above freezing can create problems in totally sealed systems, such as limiting things like photosynthesis, which is bad. But in my experience, it's the high temperatures that are the most lethal. Usually, room temperature is preferable. Even the low 80s, which is warmer than how most people would keep their rooms or their living spaces, are okay for most creatures and maybe preferable for some terrariums, depending on the biome you source the contents from. But for the most part, most terrariums will be indoors in a room that's at, well, room temperature. So assuming you're keeping it at a comfortable room temperature that is somewhere in the 60s or 70s, overheating isn't a concern, right? Well, well, not quite. First off, too much light can be a problem, especially direct sunlight. Glass containers can heat up fairly quickly with too much light because of a greenhouse effect, as well as an inability to get rid of heat through the glass. There's a barrier there. That means you should avoid placing the terrarium where it'll receive extended amounts of time in direct sunlight and make sure any artificial lights aren't too strong or too close to the ecosystem. Finally, make sure it's not directly over a heating vent or a radiator and not in front of a space heater. Any of those heat sources can cause a quick die off and a short life for your terrarium. Mistake number two, sealing the system too soon. Both the plants and macroinvertebrates need time to adjust to a newly created closed terrarium. A, a common mistake is sealing that container up on day one and keeping it closed. It, depending on the number of animals as well as the number and health of the plants, sealing it too soon can lead to a situation where oxygen is quickly depleted and the ecosystem experiences a rapid die off. It's okay to open the jar for the first few days or even the first few weeks if you're dealing with a truly airtight seal. And if the seal isn't perfectly airtight, well, that's okay too. Some of my biggest terrariums, which have been hugely successful, are not entirely sealed, like a rubber on glass type of seal you'd have with this jar that houses an aquatic ecosystem. For this terrarium, there are tiny gaps where the clear acrylic meets the tank. It's too small for even a springtail or a mite to escape through, and I still consider it a closed ecosystem, but in theory, a tiny amount of air is exchanged on a regular basis, and I'm here to tell you that that's okay. Uh, before number three on this list, let's do a quick lightning round and knock out some quick mistakes that I see from time to time. All right, let's go. Uh, make sure you have a light or that your terrarium gets plenty of direct or indirect sunlight throughout the day. Make sure you have plenty of plants or moss and make sure they have a good root system intact for the plants, of course. Don't include moths or butterflies in your terrarium. Don't keep your jar where your cat will be tempted to tip it over. And for that matter, don't keep it somewhere where it can tip over, period, because of kids, dogs, etc. Don't use store-bought dirt as the substrate. Ideally, you'd use exclusively native soil and, and detritus, I'm talking like dead wood, dead leaves and whatnot, for the substrate. And speaking of which, don't forget to give the bugs, like isopods and springtails, millipedes, snails, some sort of starter food, such as dead leaves or dead wood, so that they don't, they don't immediately get started on the moss or other plants. All right, back to the main list. Number three, too much moisture. I see this one 
all too often, and I've done it myself. I could say too little of moisture too, but, but in my experience and in the vast majority of what I've seen online, most people make the mistake of adding too much water when they're first making their terrarium. This can be detrimental to the plants and their roots and can be unhealthy for the creatures inside. Uh, this jar right here uh, experienced that problem. This is the wasteland jar. Some of you may have seen it in past videos. And it is a totally sealed system. I, I sealed it with silicone uh, along the top. From the get-go, I had added too much water. And that contributed to a large die-off inside. Now, thankfully, it's recovered but it's far from thriving and likely never will because it had and has such a high amount of moisture inside. So what's my advice? Don't add water, at least at first. Put the dirt and plants and bugs together and close the ecosystem and see how it does. If you know the soil was very dry to begin with, maybe your area is experiencing a drought, then go ahead and lightly mist it to begin with, or maybe wet a corner of the container or some of the substrate to serve as a humid place for isopods and such to hang out at. Remember, isopods need a certain level of humidity to survive. Then check for condensation throughout the day, especially at the end of the day and overnight. If you're seeing very little condensation or, or just a small amount of fog on the glass, then go ahead and add a little more water. A little, I said. It's really easy to overdo it. Then repeat the process. Most closed terrariums should and will have a constantly humid atmosphere inside. That's usually the goal, and a lot of common terrarium inhabitants like springtails, centipedes, isopods, snails, and more do just fine in that atmosphere. Well, then why do a lot of your terrarium videos come out so clear, you might ask? Uh, that's a great question. And that is because I care more about what I'm presenting to you, the viewer, than making this a truly closed system, as in sealing it up or closing it and never opening it up. No, what I do is if I'm planning on filming, I take the top off the container, usually, unless it is totally sealed like the wasteland jar that I just showed you. I take the top off the jar, I wipe or squeegee the water off the glass to give you a clear picture, and if I didn't, it would not look very good. It's not very aesthetically pleasing to try and look through fog and condensation throughout the video. Instead, I'm able to give you clear shots like this that you've been looking at throughout this video. Number four on this list, avoid creatures that will kill your plants. Most or almost all terrariums will not be able to support organisms that feed almost exclusively on living plant matter. No, I'm not talking about isopods or snails, springtails, millipedes, which might all you know nibble on some leaves or some moss from time to time. I'm talking about caterpillars, uh, certain grubs, insect larvae, grasshoppers and crickets and the like that feed almost exclusively on living plant matter. I've made this mistake. I've had a large grub, some sort of insect larva, that mercilessly killed many of the plants in one of my terrariums. I've had the same thing happen with a caterpillar. Avoid purposely putting these in and watch the ecosystem for the first few days to make sure the leaves of your plants aren't being gorged on by one of these animals. Number five, too big of creatures. Uh, closed ecosystems are for invertebrates only period. Uh, no frogs, fish, mice, squirrels, birds, salamanders, parrots, bears, or anything else that has a backbone, period. It's inhumane. These containers cannot support that kind of life. Have I thought about trying something like that? Sure. But I've come to the conclusion that I need something like the size of a large storage container to support something like a frog or a similarly sized creature. It's just not realistic. And similarly, use caution with large invertebrates too. Uh, large beetles, large spiders, large snails, or even worms that are fairly large in size are not a good fit for most closed or smaller closed ecosystems. 
Don't throw a tarantula inside of a closed ecosystem. Don't throw large beetles or a, or a large land snail in a closed ecosystem. And also, no ants. Now, I mean, I get it individually, ants are pretty small, but you need a full colony and a queen to make a successful ant colony. And again, to do this, you need a huge, massive space to support that in a closed ecosystem. If you want ants and you want to feed them and water them and all that, that's fine. Go for it. It's just not a closed ecosystem at that point, which is fine. Ants are cool. Number six on this list. This isn't really a matter of survival of the terrarium as much as it is a matter of making the hobby enjoyable. Here's some advice for you. This video might make it seem like there's a lot of ways to screw up this closed terrarium thing. And well, yeah, there is. But also, like I said at the beginning, these are intended to be low or zero maintenance creations. Once you start a closed terrarium and get it through the first week or two, it's really just a matter of watching and enjoying your creation as it changes over time. So number six on this list is to try to not get too caught up in the rules. Experiment a little and don't listen to everything you hear on YouTube or elsewhere. And that includes me. Don't feel like you need to follow a set of rules. Treat them as guidelines. You don't need a gravel bottom for drainage, a, a layer of charcoal as a filter, a mesh lining or any of those things that other channels on YouTube and elsewhere suggest. None of my terrariums have those things and they're doing just fine. Don't worry about a special substrate mix either. Just find some good soil from wherever you're getting your plants and bugs from and mix in some dead wood or maybe some dead leaves and hey, you're good to go. If you're looking to create a terrarium solely for its aesthetics, then by all means, listen to the advice from other channels like Worcester, I don't know how you pronounce that, Worcester Terrariums. Uh, terrarium Designs is another one, or the Urban Nemophilist. Those would be the channels to watch if you're looking for purely aesthetics. They will give you specific plant species. They will give you a specific substrate mix to use. They will suggest things like a gravel bottom, mesh lining, and all sorts of other tips that you may not see on this channel. If you're interested in making a terrarium that is low maintenance, a little bit more accessible and easier to create for, for most people, and is also a fairly accurate replication of nature, well, you're in the right spot. And remember that nature doesn't always follow those rules. And another thing, I already sort of mentioned this earlier in the video, but don't feel like you can never, ever open up your closed terrarium. Want to wipe the glass to show off the creation to a friend? Well, they'll think the hobby is way cooler if they can actually see inside of the jar or the tank instead of just seeing a bunch of algae and dirt and condensation. Maybe you want to open it up to add a new bug or add a new rock for decoration. I say go for it. Try some different experiments out. And finally, I encourage you to head over to Reddit where there are some awesome subreddits like Ecosphere, uh, Jarrarium, and Closed Terrarium. Those are the names of the subreddits. They're essentially like forums for those of you that may not be familiar with Reddit. Each of those subreddits focus specifically on this topic, and they're a great resource if you've got questions, if you've got concerns about your terrarium, and they're a great place to show off pictures and videos of your own terrariums. Anyways, if you found this video to be helpful, be sure to leave a comment, take care, and I'll see you next time.